Have you ever heard a really good ghost story? One of those stories that makes the hair on your neck stand up. They're riveting, aren't they? I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts. The prospect of it is quite sad, actually. But regardless of demons and spirits, though, the stories I find the most interesting are those of a more human nature. Stories of what human beings can be capable of. Stories of murder. Because a ghost won't kill you. We don't even know if ghosts are real. But murder. The violence in human nature. That's real. That can kill you. Sometimes you find a story that has been entangled. A story where the human and the spiritual coexist. And there is no story that represents that as well as the story of the Amityville murders. I'm not here to tell you the ghost story. I'm here to tell you the human story. I'm here to tell you the story of Ronald DeFeo. On November 14, 1974, a man, seemingly struck with panic, ran into a bar and begged the patrons to help him. He told them that someone had murdered his mom and dad. A small group of the patrons crammed themselves into the man's car and together they drove out to the house known as High Hopes on 112 Ocean Avenue. A house that would later be renamed as the Amityville House. A house where brutality is said to have become the infestation point for demons and evil spirits. But if we are going to tell this story properly, we need to go back to the beginning, before the demons and before the bullets. Ronald DeFeo Sr. had always been a hard-working man. He had grown up in Brooklyn working for his father-in-law at a Buick dealership. As the years went by and Ronald DeFeo Sr. became more successful, Money stopped being an issue for him and his large family. It was time to take the next step. The next step was a nice house out in Amityville, Long Island. Two stories, an attic, and a nice boathouse by the river. He had achieved the American dream with the white picket fence. But the field senior was hardened by life. He was very strict and hot-tempered, he essentially ruled his family with an iron fist. He could often become violent and got into several physical altercations with his wife Louise. Another target for his hot temper was aimed at his oldest son, Ronald DeFeo Jr. Ronald DeFeo Jr. had a rough childhood and bore many of the hot tempered traits his father had. As a young boy he was called Butch. Butch was a victim of bullying and tauntings at school. He was called fat and pushed around by the popular kids. His father caught wind of the bullying and gave his eldest son a command. He was to stick up for himself. He had to fight back against the bullies, but this advice did not apply at home. Ronald Jr. began standing up to the bullies at school, but he was absolutely forbidden to do so at home. His father would not tolerate any disobedience from his son, or there would be new bruises in the morning. Ronald Sr. may have been a hot-tempered man, but his son Ronald Jr. was worse. 
As Ronald Jr. grew up and became large enough to physically stand up to his father, he began displaying a disturbing amount of irregular behavior. His spouts of anger could come out of left field, and boxing matches between father and son became a normal occurrence in the Ocean Avenue house. As violent as his father was, even he could see that something was wrong in Ronald Jr.'s head. So together with his wife, he made Ronald Jr. go to see a psychiatrist, but it didn't help at all. Ronald Jr. just passively aggressively insisted that he didn't need any help. He seemed like a lost cause to the DeFeo parents. They were more worried than angry with their oldest son at this point. Ronald Jr. was only 14 years old at this point and his parents initiated a new tactic. They began showering their rageful son with gifts. They gave him whatever he wanted. If he wanted money, they gave it to him. They began spoiling him. At one point, when he was still only 14 years old, his parents bought him a speedboat for $14,000. When Ronald Jr. was 17, he was forced to leave the school he was attending and began taking part in more criminal activities. He began using LSD and heroin, and as he was spiraling out of control, his emotional state became increasingly more unstable. His fits of rage and violence was no longer confined to the home. At one point, while out hunting with his friends, he unprovoked aimed his rifle at one of the young men in the group. He had known the young man for years and was considered a close friend. The young man stared down the barrel of the gun and his face turned white. In panic, he ran away and Ronald Jr. lowered his rifle, surely amused by himself. Later that same day, when the group caught up with the young man again, DeFeo Jr. asked him why he had left so soon. A passive-aggressive jab as sociopathic as it is disturbing. When Ronald Jr. turned 18, his father gave him a job at his car dealership. He was given a weekly allowance whether he turned up for work or not, but nothing could soothe Ronald Jr.'s mental state. He was still using heroin, and he was combining it with speed. His emotional state, as disoriented as it was, managed to get even more unstable. He would still have this father, and at one point when his father and mother was in one of their own physical altercations, DeFeo Jr. grabbed a shotgun he kept in his room. He rushed downstairs and aimed the shotgun at his father. He was so fucking angry all the time, and as his father froze at the sight of the gun, Ronald Jr. screamed, Leave the woman alone, I'm going to kill you. You fat fuck, this is it. And then he pulled the trigger. But the gun clicked. Somehow the shotgun shell didn't fire and as the gun clicked, Ronald Jr. simply walked out of the room. He was so casual about it, so indifferent to the fact that he had almost blown his father's head off. And guns were one of Ronald Jr.'s biggest interests. He owned a lot of guns and rifles paid for by his family and he could store many of them in his room since he was the only one in the home that had his own room. In the this was the kids. The DeFeos had four more kids. There was their oldest daughter Dawn, 18 years old, Allison, 13 years old, Mark, 12 years old, and Ronald Jr.'s youngest sibling, John, 7 years old. Things had deteriorated to a critical point at this time as in the weeks before those patrons crammed themselves in the car on that fall night, Ronald Jr. had tried to scheme his father. He had been tasked with depositing $20,000 at the bank, but kept it for himself and told his father that he had been robbed. His father got angry and the cops were contacted. Ronald Jr. didn't like the cops prodding questions and he began to become increasingly threatening and violent with them. Eventually they backed off, but by that point DeFeo Jr. had calmed down. The police left and they had their doubts on Ronald Jr.'s story. During this time, Ronald Jr. got into another fight with his father. He was untamable, and his father screamed at him that, You got the devil on your back. This only angered Ronald Jr. more and he yelled back at his father, You fat prick, I'll kill you. No one believed him, but it wasn't a threat. It was a promise. on that night, in the early hours of November 14, Ronald Jr. chose his weapon, a 35 caliber Marlin rifle. He walked with a calm but determined demeanor to his parents' bedroom, 
where his father and mother were sleeping. He carefully opened their bedroom door and for a little while he just stood there watching them, knowing that whatever they were dreaming about would be the last thing they ever experienced before their execution. Without hesitation, Ronald DeFeo Jr. raised the rifle and shot his father Ronald Sr. in the back. The bullet tore through DeFeo Sr.'s kidney and Ronald Jr. quickly fired another bullet. The second bullet would pierce Ronald DeFeo Sr.'s spine and lodge in his neck. One dead, five to go. Luis DeFeo, Ronald Jr.'s mother, must have woken up from the sudden burst of fire tearing into the flesh of her husband. But even if she did, she didn't have much time to react. Ronald Jr. shot her twice as well. The shots shattered her ribcage and collapsed one of her lungs. Both parents now lay dead on their bed. Ronald left them there, lifeless in the blood-soaked sheets. It's a bit odd that no one else in the house seems to have woken up by the gunshots. But we will revisit that later. Ronald made his way to his two younger brothers' room, Mark 12 and John 7. Killing his parents was one thing, but these were just children. They never got to grow up because of their oldest brother, Ronald. Ronald stood between their beds as they laid sleeping, and then he methodically shot them both, once in the back. The bullet tore through Mark's internal organs, and the bullet that hit little John severed his spine. He lay there twitching for a short while before succumbing to death. The true story isn't about demons. It's about the senseless violence Ronald Feo Jr. brought upon his family that day. It's more sad than scary, actually. It's more of a tragic story rather than a horror story. Ronald DeFeo was not done yet though, he had two more victims, his sisters. He entered Allison's and Dawn's room, and as he did, 13-year-old Allison stirred awake and turned her head up towards him. And as she did, Ronald shot her right in the face, piercing her skull and her brain, killing her instantly. He then turned around and put the rifle against his oldest sister Dawn, 18 years old's head, and shot her. The bullet tore the right side of Don's face right off. He had left a mess behind. It had taken Ronald DeFeo 15 minutes to brutally murder his entire family. He had tied the family dog Shaggy outside. For some reason he didn't kill the dog, but Shaggy was barking his little lungs out at the carnage inside, unable to intervene. But the barking didn't disturb Ronald at all. Neither did the blood. As Ronald himself would later testify in court, he felt good. Not happy. He just felt good. Ronald took a shower, trimmed his beard, and dressed up in his boots. He put his bloody clothes and his rifle in a pillowcase. He drove out to Brooklyn and discarded the pillowcase in a storm drain. After that, he set out for work. It was now 6 a.m. Three hours had gone by since he had murdered his family. He tried his damnness to create an alibi that day. He told several people that he had been trying to call home but that no one was answering. As he went by to see his girlfriend after work, he told her the same thing and even tried to call home in front of her. He really tried to make a point of the fact that he was trying to reach his family. Later that same day, Ronald visited his friend Bob as well. He told Bob that he couldn't reach the home and that something was going on over there. He said that all the cars were still in the driveway and that he couldn't get in the house because his keys was still inside. Ronald visited more friends that day and together with them drank alcohol and did some heroin. At around 6 p.m. he met up with Bob at the local bar again and after some time of drinking and Ronald trying to call home, he said that he was worried and needed to get home. He said that he would have to break in because his keys were inside the house. Only a few minutes went by before Ronald came rushing into the bar again. Bob, you gotta help me. Someone shot my mother and father. Bobby, Ronald and a small group of patrons all crammed into the car and Bobby behind the wheel raced to the house. 
Once they got inside, they saw the bloody scene that had transpired. Ronald was outside the home acting sad and grief-stricken. Everyone was in shock. A man named Joey Yeswit took the phone inside the home and called police. He told them that there had been a shooting at the Ocean Avenue in Amityville. As the operator asked if anyone was hurt, the shocked man responded that everyone was dead. The operator was taken aback and asked him what he meant. Joey Jesuit responded that, I don't know what happened. Kid come running in the bar. He says everybody in the family was killed. We came down here. After that he was transferred to a police officer. After telling him where he was, he recounted what had happened at the bar but this time said that a man had rushed in saying his mother and father had been shot. The inconsistency I would imagine is surely due to shock. A police officer arrived at the scene and was met with Ronald DeFeo on the lawn. Ronald was sobbing and yelling that his mother and father were dead. The police officer went inside and found the bodies of Ronald's parents and his two young brothers. The officer went back downstairs to talk to a sobbing Ronald who told him that he also had two sisters. The officer rushed back upstairs and saw the two girls dead, both shot in the face. Ronald DeFeo Jr. gave many different accounts of what had happened that night. The first one came when police asked him who could have done this. Ronald answered that a man named Louis Fellini had held a grudge against the family. Fellini was a mafia hitman. Fearing that organized crime may be the motivation, police brought Ronald to their headquarters where they interviewed him further. While there, he gave his statement of that night. He said that he had been up late watching a movie on television, he couldn't sleep that night and recounted that he had seen his brother's wheelchair in front of the bathroom door at 4am and that he had heard the toilet flush shortly thereafter. He then said that as he couldn't sleep he decided to go to work early and the rest of his recount is of what he did that day, of all the times he tried to call home. He kept talking to the detectives about his family and even told them that he was a heroin user and that he once had helped his father commit an insurance fraud. The reason he had pointed out Fellini was supposedly because Fellini had lived with them for a while and had, and had hidden gems and cash in the basement, but an incident had occurred on the car dealership between Fellini and Ronald Sr. So far the police didn't suspect Ronald, he was cooperating very well but it wouldn't take long for his story to collapse. As police did a second look around in Ronald DeFeo's room, they found two boxes of ammo. The ammo was for a Marlin rifle, 35 caliber, the same weapon and the same ammo that had been used in the murders. The first inconsistency was the time. Ronald had said that he had been home during the night and had left early in the morning, but the detectives told him that the family couldn't have been killed during the day where Ronald was away, because they were all sleeping and they all had their bedclothes on. The detective kept chipping away at Ronald's theory that the murders took place while he was at work, determining that it would have taken place between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. After some prodding, the detectives had established one thing, that Ronald DeFeo was physically linked to the crime scene as he was said to have been home when the crimes took place. Ronald desperately tried to not let his story fall apart and told the officer that while he had been home, he had only been in the rooms after the family had been murdered. Which makes his behavior the following day calling home very bizarre. The officer then told him that all the victims had been shot with a Marlin 35 caliber bullet and that they had found a box with the same bullets in his room. They knew that he knew more than he was letting on. It was his gun that had been used to kill the family. Ronald kept changing his story and just dug himself a deeper hole. This time he said that Fellini had woken him up at gunpoint and Fellini had brought an accomplice and together they forced Ronald to watch as they went room to room killing his family. But he couldn't give any sort of physical description of the accomplice. Ronald kept running his mouth in pure desperation and managed to implicate himself even more when he said that he had collected evidence on the crime scene. At that point, detectives had to stop him and ask why he would have to take the empty gun shells if he didn't know that Fellini had been using his gun. Ronald was falling apart. He allowed him to describe how Fellini had killed the family before springing the final trap. They must have made you a piece of it. 
they must have made you shoot at least one of them, or some of them, the interrogator proposed to Ronald the Fail. Ronald didn't say anything and the officer added, It didn't happen that way, did it? Ronald now had his head in his hands and said, Give me a minute. They knew they had him at this point and the officer went in for the kill, saying, Butch, they were never there, were they? Fellini and the other guy were never there. Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr. had lost his composure at this point, as he responded with, No. It all started so fast. Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. And just like that, only about a day after the bodies had been discovered, Ronald DeFeo's story had been destroyed. He had confessed to murdering his family. The trial was messy. Ronald DeFeo insisted that he was insane and told the court that he had been possessed by the devil. He also tried to act out a bit and even went as far as threatening the judge. During the trial, the defense attorney showed Ronald a photo of his mother and asked him if he knew her. Ronald responded that he had never seen her before in his life and when asked about the murders, he said that he had killed them all in self-defense. Ronald wasn't trying to make it look like a self-defense case, he just wanted to show how crazy he was. And one might argue that you'll need at least a dab of crazy to do something like that. It was also during the trial that he admitted to feeling good about the murders. The battle between the prosecutor and attorney went on, but Ronald DeFeo couldn't convince everyone that he was crazy. His behavior had been too well thought out. His calm collecting and removal of evidence, his desperate attempts to set up an alibi calling home in front of people, those aren't the acts of an radical madman snapping. Those are cold and thought out actions. Ronald DeFeo Jr. was sentenced to 25 years in jail for each murder which amounts to 150 years behind bars. Ronald has since then claimed a lot of things. He jumped onto the Amityville horror exploitation train and said that he had been possessed by demons. He said that his mother had killed the family and he at one point said that his sister Dawn had murdered the family and that he had killed her to stop her. The odd thing about that though is that Dawn had gunpowder on her body. But this was never investigated by police, it was simply written down. Perhaps there is a very logical explanation to this, but it's a little odd. But with that said, we shouldn't listen so much to Ronald DeFeo. He has tried to pass the blame onto anybody that he can. He is desperate, and in his desperation he constantly changes his story. The six family members had only been dead for about a year when George and Kathy Lutz bought a home in Amityville. They had big economical problems at the time, Yet they somehow managed to cough up the money for the house. Well, however, they only lived there for about 28 days. After 28 days, they gave their claims of demons and violent spirits. They decided to say this in a press conference. They had to leave the house in terror because of floating pig heads, swarms of flies and abusive demons. Shortly after that, a book was released by a soap opera writer and it was stamped as a true story. This now meant that the Amityville Horror, a true story, was on the bookshelves in every bookstore in the nation. The book drew out the curious people. Everyone wanted to peek into the haunted demon house. And the phenomenon grew bigger when a movie was released. George and Kathy Lutz had all of a sudden fixed all of their economical problems and moved to Los Angeles. This episode isn't about the demons that was claimed to live within the High Hopes home in Amityville, but I can say this. The tales of horror and demonic activity was debunked by the Catholic Diocese, by the Amityville Police Department, by Ronald DeFeo's defense attorney, and it was even debunked by George and Kathy Lutz themselves as they recanted several of the things they said happened. Things they couldn't explain under scrutiny was just recanted. The family that moved into the Amityville house after the Lutz were never disturbed by any paranormal activity. I do wonder about that night. Why didn't anyone wake up? Well, Alison DeFeo woke up and was shot in the face, 
but what about the rest? One explanation could be that they simply froze with fear, especially the small kids, something that has been known to happen, but did all of them freeze? And I imagine that a small boy scared enough to freeze like that would at least piss himself, but from what I can gather they hadn't urinated on themselves before they died, and Ronald didn't use a silencer either. Is it possible that he had an accomplice? I guess so. However, I do think that some of them were awake and that they froze unless they were really heavy sleepers. It's odd. It really is. But what we do know is that with or without any help, Ronald DeFeo was no innocent man. Ronald DeFeo murdered his own family that night. The memory of those that died has been clouded in a shroud of paranormal fanatics. No one seems to give a shit about what happened on November 14, 1974 on 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville. That story deserves to be told more than the ones about floating pig heads. People think that what George and Kathy went through was horrible and scary. But what about what Allison, Don, Louise, Ronald Sr, Mark and John went through that night? It was worse than what any demon can do and it was done by a human being. Humans can be a hell of a lot scarier than demons.